Welcome to PNF 404, home of the Pikmin. I actually grew up amongst the Pikmin. Uh, I had to drink nectar to survive. It's a very tough life. My name is PNF 404 McGee. My parents really hated me. But you can call me Pikmin McGee. That's what all my friends call me. And since we're all friends, you can call me that too. And since I'm a bit of an expert on the planet of PNF 404, since I grew up here, allow me to teach you about the biology of all the creatures that we can find here. However, before I begin to explain the biology of the creatures that live here, I think I should discuss a little bit about the planet itself first. While the exact atmospheric composition of PNF 404 is unknown, what we can infer is that it at least has high levels of oxygen. We can infer this because of the fact that there are a, lar a lot of large insectoid-like creatures. I be now, while the bugs of PNF 404 are very large, they are not eagle sized like Meganera. So I theorize that instead of it, the oxygen level being at 35% like Earth during Carboniferous, it's more around like 25. That's a very rough estimate, don't get me wrong, to take it with a grain of salt, but I'd say it's around 25%. We can also see that the planet is tectonically active. We can see this from when the Copites versus the Hockitations first crash landed on PNF 404. When the Hockitations first crash landed on PNF 404, the planet looked almost like Earth. It was very strange if you think about it. When the Hockitations landed on PNF 404, it looked like what scientists have named Pangea Ultima which is a theoretical supercontinent. It is what scientists theorize the Earth will look like in 250 million years. Now is also probably a good time to mention that PNF 404 might just be Earth. This seems to be remnants of a civilization that once lived here. Scientists have taken to calling them humans. I think that's how you say it. But these humans, they lived here, and we can see the remnants of their civilization through the different treasures that can be found here, such as the Courage Reactor, or the Quenching Elf Emblem. Now, what the purpose of these treasures, our scientists can only theorize about. There are some treasures that can help us theorize about what this lost civilization might have been like, such as the Time Capsule, which shows a photo of a really odd creature that we can't see anymore, or the Colossal Fossil, which is a large skull of some extinct creature that used to run the planet long ago. I theorize that at some point in PNF 404's history, there was a large scale mass extinction event that wiped out these humans, as well as most life on this planet. The reason I believe there was a large extinction event on this planet is because we see barely any mammals. If PNF 404 is assumed to be Earth, we know that mammals ruled over Earth for millions of years after the dinosaurs went extinct. I also believe there was a mass extinction event because what else could have wiped out this large civilization that once lived here? If we look around with the Geiger counter, we can see that there are high levels of radiation on this planet. I theorized that these humans nuked themselves into oblivion. <laughs> I mean like, the radiation levels can't be that high, right? Oh shit! Now that we got the planet itself out of the way, we can now move on to the organisms that live here. Let's start at the impact site.
organism that we can find here is the red pigment. My name's Bartholomew, and I've been through a lot of shit. I was born into the fire. I've hung out with the low lives in the slums, and I've had the displeasure of meeting with pigmen of the highest order in society. And I gotta say, they're all piece of shit. No matter where I looked, all I would find were these vain pigmen looking for more and more transactional sap. Money is the thing that drives us, which is ironic considering it's a pigment creation. You see, God made pigment in his own image, and we made money in our own image. We made sure to put our faces on it, and we made sure it would live like a pigment. You see, nature is made entirely out of life transactions. Something's gotta die so another thing may live, and money essentially carries it over by dictating the trajectory of pigment life. If you don't have enough money, you'll die. If you have too much money, you will seek monetary gain through these aforementioned pigment, potentially killing them in the process. After a while, I realized that finding the system was well and truly meaningless, so I let go of these hopes and I decided to search for someone to serve instead. Not in exchange for money, but in exchange for my life. Look, <laughs> Red Pikmin is literally Ryan Gosling. Anyways, what's cool about the Red Pikmin is that they have a unique cell structure that allows them to be fire resistant. Oh, and I have a theory. Who are you? Uh, doesn't matter. But to, uh, now, I have a theory that Red Pikmin, so due to the fact that they're resistant to fire, I believe they're made of asbestos and... Like, I mean, because Resestos is fire resistant, like, I'm just saying, I think it's a cool concept, and I don't think enough people are acknowledging my genius here. I'm just saying, like... Sorry about the interruption, guys. Uh, I don't know what just happened exactly, but it was really weird. Just to be clear, red pigment are not made of asbestos. I don't know why that guy ate that Pikmin. Anyways, what red Pikmin do have though, is they have a sharp nose, like, like that, yeah. It's a sharp nose, and it increases their attack on other organisms. Essentially, it, it deals more damage to the organisms that they eat. We'll take back to the onions. Another creature that actually lives here in the impact site is the pearly clam clam. The pearly clam clam is a freshwater bivalve which is interesting because most of them live in the ocean. Now, while in modern day there are freshwater bivalves, they're not too common, at least to my knowledge. I've never seen a freshwater bivalve. I don't know about you guys. For now, there isn't much else we can do here in the impact site, but we will return here later. Right now, we're gonna head to the Forest of Hope. We now arrive in the Forest of Hope. If you look over here, actually, we can see a sleeping spotty bulborb. The, the spotty bulborb, or Oculus Kageyami rusus, is a nocturnal predator that will hunt for prey returning to their nest. They are commonly seen eating Pikmin that are not able to get back to their onions at, in time before it reaches night. The spotty bulborb has a mix of both mammalian and non-mammalian traits, such as the fact that they give birth to live young, and also the fact they have a three-stage life cycle. Those three stages being that they are first born as a larva, then they mature into a juvenile spotty bulbworm. They don't yet have their spots or their red backs. After that, they then gain their white spots and red back. What's interesting about the bulbworm is that their brains are actually in the back of their bodies as opposed to the front, which you would think the front would be where their brain would be since that's where their face is. But no, it's actually in the back, which is why if you throw a pigment at the back of them, it deals more damage. Surrounding the spotty bulborb are what are called dwarf bulborbs, or Panseris seduculi russus. The dwarf bulborb is actually a mimic species, and not a juvenile bulborb, like you might think. It uses its mimicry to blend in with the other bulborbs so that they won't eat it. The dwarf bulborb is closer related to bread bugs. Hey, if you look over there, I think I actually spot a differently colored onion.
Name is Wilbur. On a long enough timeline, the evolutionary expedition that has led us to this point will eventually be all for nothing. How do I cope with that? Well, for the longest time, I couldn't really comprehend it. I mean, us Pikmin, we weren't really made to think this far into the future. That's why Empire's fall. There's just not a lot of Pikmin around who can work around such long periods of time. Us regular old yellow Pikmin, we're really screwed because when we think about such long periods of time passing, it gets scary. Might be only me, but when I really get to thinking about that, I become petrified. It's the only thing I can think about for weeks on end. It's debilitating. Uh, and I tried to make amends with this fact, and many different ways over the years. I've tried going to where the hedonist, I've tried to devote myself to a deity, I tried to find myself and that was all for nothing. Then I came to an epiphany. If we're all eventually gonna die, not only die but functionally get erased as history ceased to exist, uh, we might as well go out with a bang. That was my brother. Just think about what happened to him, it's electrifying. I've truly learned nothing and I'm not ashamed to admit it. What's interesting about yellow Pikmin is that they have a much lower body density than any other type of Pikmin. This allows them to be able to be thrown higher. Another advantage they have when it comes to being thrown higher is these ears right here. These ears actually are able to catch the wind very easily. They likely have hollow bones, which adds to their light density. Most yellow Pikmin are able to conduct electricity. However, our dear buddy Wilbur here has a condition known as conductile dysfunction which makes it so that he can't conduct electricity as well as the other Pikmin. To find a new purpose in life, Wilbur here has taken up a new job as a suicide bomber. These yellows are the only type of Pikmin that can pick up the bomb rocks. Why this is the case, I have no idea. Maybe they're just not scared of them, maybe the other Pikmin are. Who knows? If we head north in the Forest of Hope, we'll run into the Armored Cannon Beetle. The Armored Cannon Beetle, or Granitus Choculinae, is one of the largest organisms we have encountered so far. It uses the hole at the top of its head to suck in air, which it will then use to propel a large clump of dirt and debris at its target. The armored cannon beetle seems to be highly territorial, attacking anything that gets near it. In its larval stage, the armored cannon beetle will shoot large clumps of dirt from a hole that it digs itself into. They also seem to be very highly territorial, much like the adults. In the forest, though, you have to be careful where you step or else you could run into a shear grub. The shear grubs burrow into the ground and will come up when disturbed to attack anything that they see. What's interesting about the shear grubs is that they have sexual dimorphism. Sexual dimorphism is when the males and females of a species have different traits that varying by sex. The males are darker in coloration and have larger pincers, while the females are lighter in coloration and have much smaller pincers. The males also seem to be the only ones that are actually aggressive. Not only do you have to watch out for shear grubs, but you also have to watch out for the burrowing snaggard. Yet another burrowing predator. The burrowing snaggard is very similar in appearance to modern day birds, minus the large snake-like body. The burrowing snaggard, or Shiropedes anaconda, is one of the deadliest hunters here in the forest of hope. You see, what it does is it burrows underground and then will come up from the ground to eat anything that gets near it. The burrowing snagger is a member of the Snavian family, an odd bunch of organisms that all share many similarities to modern day birds, yet also bear a striking resemblance to snakes. Very little is known about the juvenile snagger. Now that we've seen everything there is to see in the Forest of Hope, we can now move on to the damp, dark cave that is the Forest Navel. Here we can see many strange creatures specifically adapted to live among the darkness, such as the Wallywog. The Wallywog is an animal that bears a close resemblance to that of a frog. The Wallywog, unlike modern day frogs, doesn't use its tongue to catch prey. Rather, it'll jump up high into the air and then come right back down and crush whatever's underneath it. The Wallywogs in the forest navel are very weird as unlike their above ground cousins, the yellow Wallywog, 
They have a white appearance and red eyes. The Wally Wog appears to be a product of allopatric speciation. Allopatric speciation is when two groups of organisms get separated by some form of land and then adapt to new environments based on these rapid changes. A good example of this would be none other than Darwin himself when he studied the finches of the Galapagos Islands. The finches of the Galapagos Islands all specifically adapted to have different shaped beaks to access different food sources that were unique to those islands. But back to the Wallywog. Both the yellow and normal Wallywog have a life cycle that is very reminiscent of modern day frogs, where they start as tadpoles and then gradually grow up into the actual frogs themselves. These tadpoles have been nicknamed wogpoles by scientists. There's also a separate species of Pikmin that we can find here, the blue Pikmin. Вчера отидох до магазина за да си купя прасно мляко. Прасно краве мляко. За да си направя палачинки. И когато влязох в магазина, завих наляво, завих надясно, завих наляво, завих надясно. И намерих нещо ужасно. Алеята пълна с мляшни продукти. Нямаше никакво мляко. Никакво животинско мляко. Нито от крава, нито от коза, нито от пиво. Нямаше нищо. И аз не знае какво правя. Бял са катени физически и психически. Няма достатъчно допамин. Няма достатъчно калци. Ня нищо, което да ме пази от смърт. Някой си фалшиво мляко и да го а, донеса на касиерката, за да се, за да се разправям с нея. Да отивам. Взимам соевото мляко и ходя към нея. И казвам. Абе, ей, коста с това кисело мляко е. Абе, аз мисля, че вие бяхте готин магазин, който продаваше готино мляко за готини хора. Ама какво правиш за живота си, бе? Слушай. Аз идвам от най-готиното място, което някъде се съществувало и ще ти развърля живота, ако спреш да продаваш с... коста с това кисело мляко, е. И казвам. Абе, ей. А, 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 Морти. Мен, I have no idea what this guy just said. Anyways, the blue Pikmin, unlike the red and yellow Pikmin, are able to breathe underwater using the little gills they got right here. They also can throw Pikmin out of water that are drowning. Other than that, they got nothing else going for them. They're basically useless. Those the Pikmin are trying to carry a pellet posy back to the onion. But if you look behind them, you'll see a bread bug is following closely. The bread bug is a scavenger that can be found here in the forest stable. The bread bug has a very thick hide that prevents it from being attacked by most predators. When we head south in the forest stable, we can find the fiery blowhogs. The fiery blowhogs are one of the few mammals on PNF 404. They are closely related to pigs, as seen with their scientific name having the same genus as them. The snout of the fiery blowhog has been modified into essentially a flamethrower. What they do is they have a phosphorus compound in their nose, which they then spray out, which will catch fire immediately upon contact with the air. I imagine it has a mucus-like membrane inside of its nose to protect itself from the intense heat of the fire. If you look up, you can see the honey wisp. The honey wisp is one of the strangest creatures that lives here on this planet as it has no close relation to anything. There's nothing that it could possibly be related to in modern day or anything else on PNF 404, which begs the question, how exactly did it end up evolving in the first place? Oh god, there's a lot of yucky bugs here in the forest navel, such as the shearwig. The shearwig is in the same family as the sheargrub. In fact, they are very closely related. The shearwig only differs in that it has wings and a green coloration, as well as what we can assume to be no sexual dimorphism. Oh god, there's even more yucky bugs here. Ugh. Such as the beady long legs. While the beady long legs might look like a spider, it is in fact not an arachnid at all. But while it is classified under its own family, the arachnorms, I believe its distant relatives are the apilions. The apilions is the family that encompasses the modern day daddy long legs, which the beady long legs has a striking resemblance to. As we make our way through the forest stable, there's one last organism that lives here. That being the puffstool. Puffstool is incredibly different from any other creature on PNF 404 in that it is a living mushroom. 
the puffstool is able to emit a gaseous cloud of spores that, when inhaled by a Pikmin, will infect them and turn them into what I have called a Puffman. I believe it is related to the modern day Cordyceps fungus. The Cordyceps fungus is a fungus that will infect ants and mind control them into going high up into branches and then dying, where the mushroom will then release more spores to infect more ants. Some of the Pikmin have actually been infected by this puff stool gas. Let's go take a look at some of them right now. Huh. It looks like the leaf on its head has been replaced by a mushroom. Oh, huh, that's weird. It's also its skin is a deep purple color. The grotesque nature of life is reared its ugly head. Minutes pass by in agony. Each minute is more excruciating than the last. I've come to realize something. If I wasn't controlled by this fungus, I would be controlled by my instinctual mechanisms. There is essentially no difference. I've just been fooled into thinking that said mechanisms are quote unquote me, and I cannot be detached from them. The puff stool has proven me wrong. Anything ingrained into you can be overwritten, rearranged, and distorted. As I check my fellow men, I am reveling in my own inability to prevent myself from doing so, and now I realize there's no point to it, as the infection will kill me in a matter of days. And this will all have been for nothing. All my thoughts, feelings, and actions have been for nothing. It also appears the Pikmin's genitals have grown by 50%. What's really on? Now that we've seen all there is to see in Forest Naval, let's go ahead and move on to the distant spring. In the distant spring, we can find a close cousin of the fiery blowhog, the puffy blowhog. The puffy blowhog, by the way, has a very funny scientific name, that being Sus and Flata. I don't know. Every time I hear it, it makes me chuckle a little bit. Unlike the fiery blowhog in the forest navel, the puffy blowhog doesn't actually breathe fire, nor does it have any limbs of any kind. Instead, it has a specialized air bladder which it uses to be able to float above the ground. And also, it will knock over Pikmin with large gusts of air that it can shoot out of its nose. In the distant spring, we can also find a close cousin of the spotty bulb worm, the spotty bull bear. The spotty bull bear is actually active during the day, unlike its nocturnal cousin. Surrounding it is the dwarf bull bears, which unlike the dwarf bull borbs, the dwarf bull bears are actually the juvenile bull bears. The dwarf bull bears can be seen following their parents around while they patrol. Among the organisms that live in the distant spring is the strangest member of the grub dog family, the water dumble. Unlike its cousins, the bull borb and the bull bear, it does not walk on land. Rather, it is a fully aquatic species of grub dog, making one of the most unique members of its family. One of the biggest nuisances on PNF 404 is the swooping snitch bug. The swooping snitch bug has no rhyme or reason to what it does, but what it does do is really annoying. It'll pick up your Pikmin and then instantly plant them back into the ground for no particular reason. You know, from what I hear, there's an egg in the distant springs that when you open it, will give you a hundred free Pikmin of any type. And I found it, it's right here. I think we should go take some Pikmin and throw it at it. What's that, Jackie? I can't understand you. Maybe I'll get someone to translate for you after I break this egg open. Away, ah. Oh, so that's what Jackie is trying to do. Okay. That's a lot of dead people. I think we should probably get out of here. I think there was some stuff on the impact site we still haven't seen yet. Feels good to be back here at the impact site. There are two rather mysterious organisms that live here that I've yet to cover. Those being the Gulix and the Muda. 
The Gulex is an organism made up of a water-like substance. Now, if it's actually water, I'm not sure. But what I do know is that if any Pikmin other than Blues gets thrown at it, they'll end up drowning inside. How exactly that happens, I don't know. It appears the water also gets stuck to their stems, which is really odd. Another interesting thing about the Gulex is that its scientific name includes the word siphonophore, which possibly means it's a siphonophore. Now, what is a siphonophore, you might be asking? Well, a siphonophore is a single-celled colony of organisms that make up a larger organism, such as a Portuguese man o' war. And oh my god, not you again! Freaking get off the stage! Look, li listen. The the, the Gulex is actually an early stage of the Umibozu, and it, like, according to the Umibozu, it's yeah. freak. No, no, we're not doing that here. We're not doing that here. No Umibozu. No. The Muna is a much more mysterious organism, having no scientific name or even a scientific family that it resides in. It doesn't even attack the Pikmin. Instead, what it does is it smashes them into the ground, planting them. Yet, when it plants them, they get instantly flowered. The only thing pointing at an origin for the Mamuda is the Smoky Prog. The Smoky Prog is an embryonic stage in the Mamuda's life. Basically, it's a Mamuda embryo. That's what we were seeing earlier. And with that, we leave the impact site for the last time and embark on the last leg of our journey, the final trial. When we first arrive in the final trial, we can find a strange plant that has a weird relationship with the Pikmin. These plants are called candy pop buds. You see, when you throw a Pikmin into the candy pop bud, it'll come out a different color, that color being the same color that the candy pop bud is. Only one other animal actually lives here in the final trial, the Emperor Bulblax. The Emperor Bulblax is the largest member of the Grub Dog family so far. The Emperor Bulblax is a long, whip-like tongue that it will use to catch any Pikmin that are in its way. It also has a hard shell on its back, preventing it from being attacked. It'll burrow itself into the ground, waiting for anything to come near before it'll lash out at them with its big tongue. And with that, we end our journey. I'm so glad you can join us on this little excursion of ours. I hope that you all learned something valuable from your time on PNF 404. And if you didn't, well that's okay. At least you learned about the wonderful ecosystems here of this planet. Each and every single one of them is just as complex as the other. In is the bright the me the I still have no idea what the Pikmin is saying. But anyways, see you later, alligator. Hey everyone, uh, I just want to say thank you for getting this far in the video. Uh, if you're this far in the video, it means you probably enjoyed it, so please make sure to like and comment and subscribe and do all that. Uh, it also lets me know that you'd like to see more videos like this. Uh, if this video does well enough, I'll make a part 2 where I cover Pikmin 2. There was also a whole segment of this video I had to cut out involving the evolutionary tree. I just felt uh, it was restating a lot of what I said in the video. If you'd like to see that, let me know in the comments, and I will make a follow-up video that includes all the information. But anyways, uh, thank you so much for watching. Please, please, please like, comment, subscribe, and I will see you all later.